be able to get it unless they watch, they, unless they listen to one of my videos. So one of our one of our um, our assignments was to I had to go through and I had to use the closed caption on one of my five minute videos. Okay, so it's just one of my random videos in here. You know, they got cut, you know, out of five minutes for some reason, and it took me forever. And I'm telling you, I really respect those people who do the closed caption. You know how you watch sports and as they're talking, you're, you're reading it? That's a lot of work. So why am I telling you this? Because I had an epiphany. As I was going through that lecture, it was the one on uh, the beginning of World War II. And it was about the Battle of Britain. And remember the Battle of Britain? Yeah, the bombing of, of Britain, remember? How did the Germans, I'm sorry, how did the British make it so that they could they could find out that the Germans were coming before they radar. They used radar. They started using radar. And so somehow as I'm as I'm you know reading through my transcript of, of that lecture, um, I started talking about you know I go off on tangents. I started talking about drones and A, um, UAVs, you know what that is? And I realized that when we started using drones first, it was history was repeating itself. Because how did we use airplanes in World War One? Uh, Just for surveillance. How did we use drones for the first time? Surveillance. surveillance. And then what did we do with the drones? We started putting bombs on them, right? And that's exactly what we did in World War One. So it's interesting how I don't know why that came to me, but it's relevant because um, that's kind of what we're going we're gonna to be referencing, referencing some of that today. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's review a little bit. A bit. When did the Korean War start? 50. When did it end? 53. Who was the president that started the war? Or, was it, okay, all right. So Truman. Who was the president that ended the war? Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Um, why did Eisenhower not get reelected? I'm sorry. Why did Truman not get reelected? He didn't use the uh, Oh, uh, McCarthy. Uh, no. Okay, MacArthur, not McCarthy. What happened to MacArthur? He got fired. Why? He was talking smack to Truman, right? Okay. Um, so then Eisenhower comes in, and how did he do, do things differently than Truman? He's a military guy. He said, this is going to happen or else what? We're going to use what? Nukes. Against? Well, North Korea. Okay. So, um, war is going to end. How does it end? An armistice, which is what exactly? It's an agreement to stop fighting. Okay. So there's not a treaty, right? Okay. During the same time as the Korean War, McCarthyism was going on. Now, what was McCarthyism? Well, the second Red Scare, technically, but go ahead. Hunt for communists and so forth, and not only within the government, but within the movie industry, all over America. Okay? How did McCarthy, what, what happened to, what led to his downfall? Who did he go after? Went after the military. So, remember, these things are going on at the same time. Okay? The space race is going to start later in 1958. What's going to happen? There's a couple things that happened in between. I'm not going to go over a lot of it, bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> between 53 and 58 or whatever. But I'll tell you a couple things. Um, the highway system is going to be created. The national highway system. Do you know why we did that? By the way, it was one of the biggest projects ever in U.S. history. Besides the Erie Canal. What was the purpose of the highway system? Was it so that we could all travel around and, and go see Yosemite Park? No. no. It wasn't so we could transport the uh, missiles So we could move our forth. military very yeah. quickly and efficiently, okay? Um, whether it be missiles or tanks well, or Well, at whatever. the time, the Cuban... So What's that? At the no. time with the... Yes, okay? Um, that was like 56. And 54, 55, um, they start building, which I did not talk about and I won't, so I'll mention it now. Um, they start talking, or they start building suburbs. What were they called? Anybody know? Can't remember if it was in this chapter or the one before. Levitt towns or levy towns. And levy towns, if you look out, just walk out the, walk out the building, the, the, um, the school, 
and go over here. Does every house, for the most part, look the same? Okay, these houses, I'll bet you, I don't know, were built in the 50s. Okay? Ask, ask your parents if they even know, because when you buy a house, you know, they tell you when the house was built. The school was built around the 50s, so. Sure, and that's why there's what? The, the tunnels. Yeah. There's a uh, fallout shelter. In between here, as far as I know, there's, there's a tunnel between here and, yeah. and the middle school. Yeah. Never been there, would love to check it out though. Okay, <laughs> it'd be a good field trip. Yeah. Um, because we don't have to go anywhere. Um, okay, so that was going on. Um, duck and cover drills with the little turtle and all that stuff was going on, you know? Yeah, hey, get under your desk because it's going to save you from a nuclear bomb. Yep. <laughs> all right. Um, you know, so, you know, Elvis came about during the episode. So all of these things are going on at the same time. All right, Vietnam is going to start in 1954. Now we'll go. I'm going to go over that in detail later. But technically, that starts in the 1950s. Now we're at a very low level. Okay, and then when we get to the 60s, it's a different story. Okay, so you know it's during the time of Eisenhower. So what happens? What are some other significant things that happened during uh, Eisenhower? So we talked about space race and Sputnik in 1958. The next, I would say, major thing is going to happen in 1960. Okay. How many of you know about Area 51? Okay, it's a very famous secret location. How do you know about that? Anyway, um, it's secret because you don't know what's going on there, except for the aliens that reside there and are running the place. No, I'm just kidding. So try transcribing that kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. I joked him. So anyway, at Area 51, what is Area 51? Well, Area 51, um, there was a book that came out uh, because all this stuff was released. It was all top secret, and in 2007 or 8, some of it was released. And they started talking about the Oxcart program, which was the, you guys know what the SR-71 is? It's the precursor of the stealth bombers. It looks like this. Um, and, you know, it flies really fast when people follow yeah. alien ships, you know. It's kind of like this. I mean, that's a horrible, you know, example. But those of you that saw it, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's a black, uh, the black bird. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, it was secret for a long time. So fastest plane ever, you know. But um, so they make planes. They they do secret research on planes and whatever else at, at Area 51. But the planes are pretty known, and that's why they think they see UFOs and stuff like that. They're always testing these planes. Well, one of the planes they made was called the U-2. And the U-2 was a very special plane. It had one purpose. And the purpose was reconnaissance. <clears throat> now, have you ever seen a glider? A glider has really, really wide wings and a really kind of cylindrical body. It doesn't look like other planes. Um, and it's made a certain way so that they can float. Well, the U-2 um, was designed to fly almost in space, not exactly. So if this is space and this is like the atmosphere, it's kind of in between. And this thing would fly that high, it was super fast, all right? But what was unique about it, besides that, was it had this super duper camera on it. And this camera, let's say Aaron was, was the USSR, it would go over the USSR and it would take pictures of everything. And then they would come back, they would take the film out of the, out of the camera, and these experts, they'd blow up the film, so there'd be the, these big tables with like light coming out of everything. And they'd take like uh, magnifying glasses and they'd sit there and pour over these things. And they would locate where all the military bases are, where their nuclear power plants were, and all these things were. So that when we got, if we ever got to the point where we had to attack, either conventionally or with nukes, we would know exactly where to hit them. Yeah. Um. Well, last summer when I went to D.C. Mm -hmm. on a vacation, we went to the uh, American History Museum. Mm -hmm. And they had this section that was on the Cold War. It was really cool. It was all like silvery, stainless steel and everything. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And um, they had this table, like you were saying, that had the light blown up and it had one of the pictures. And cool. next to it, it said this was a missile silo and this is a metal uh, warehouse. Yeah. And you couldn't tell. It was so grainy. Oh, oh. So they had this, like you said, they had a little magnifying glass, and you could look over them, and you basically couldn't tell the difference. And you could not tell no, the difference? No, I couldn't tell well, the difference. But they were trained, though. Yeah, they I mean, were they, trained. They knew what to look for and stuff like that, because when, you know. <clears throat> so, now, 
we were flying over the Soviet Union for years, you know, like four or five years, and they knew we were doing this, but they couldn't shoot us down because, because at the time the rockets, the um, technology in Russia, it, their their rockets could not get up to the U-2, so it would go up, it would come back down, then they make another one, it would go up a little higher, and they make another one, it would go up a little higher, they make another one, it would go up a little higher, and then they make another one, and they would shoot it down, and that's exactly what happened in 1960. So in 1960, um, U-2 spy plane was shot down over the USSR. Plane was taking pictures of uh, missile sites, and but the pilot got he, you know, uh, what do you call it? Ejected. Ejected. Thank you. Ejected, and he survived, and they caught him. So Khrushchev, of whom because Stalin had died, Khrushchev is now the new premier. There's going to be a series of these guys, all the way up to Gorbachev in the 1980s. But he's like the 1950s guy. So he tells you know, uh, Eisenhower, hey, we shot down one of your planes and we got your guy. What does Eisenhower say? Do that. Um, what are you talking about? I don't know. I don't have a plane. I have no idea what you're talking about. And Khrushchev kept saying, hey, I want an apology. I want you to you know, stop these flights and stuff like that. Now, at the same time, there was supposed to be a summit. Do you know what a summit is? It's like a conference. So the, the Soviets and the Khrushchev and Eisenhower were going to get together and they were going to talk about the Cold War. It was a warming period. But then, <coughs> then, they shot down the plane. Eisenhower denies it. Khrushchev gets mad and calls off the summit. Okay, and then finally, Eisenhower fesses up and says, "Okay, all right, you know, all right, we've been flying over it, whatever, whatever." And he promises not to fly over the Soviet Union anymore because he didn't want things to get worse. <clears throat> so, but that that doesn't mean we can't fly or fly over you and you and you and you and you, right? We just can't go right here. So we're still going to use the plane, not that one, you know. Okay, and then a couple of years later, they do a swap, and we have one of their spies or something. We got Francis Gary Powers back. However, I'm pretty sure he talked. Don't know what he know, because they didn't tell these guys everything for, on real, for, uh, for um, you know, on purpose. Okay, so he calls out the sun. So the U-2 spy plane incident is, a, is, is one of the key events during the Cold War, okay? Now, Eisenhower is still president at this point, and the let's let's jump over. We're going to talk about Cuba for a minute. <clears throat> just like Iran, just like other countries where we had, in, in, remember China, Chiang Kai Shek. We we back these people up. What what always happened to these people? Yeah. They always became corrupt because we always throw a lot of money. There was a guy named Batista in Cuba, and he was our guy. Now, you have to remember, Cuba was like a playground for the rich and famous in America. People would fly down. There was like the second Las Vegas. They would go down there and party and have a good time. Um, you know, and there was no problems. You, know, you could just go there like you were going to another state. And at the time, like I said, Batista was in power. But he started to get corrupt like they all do. And we started to not like him so much anymore. And so we wanted a change of leaders there. And we found somebody. So his name was Fidel Castro. Now, Fidel Castro, in the beginning, we liked him. Because he seemed like he was going to be amiable towards what we wanted, our goals. But the Soviets started to court him also. And now he had both of us, you know, going, okay, he goes, man, I can cho choose whoever I want. And in the end, he ends up choosing the Soviets. They, he must have liked the deal better. And he probably liked the fact that, you know, being communist, they could pretty much do what they wanted. So, um, him as the leader. So what he did, just like all other dictators, is they eliminate all their enemies. And then they rule by what? By fear or force. And they make the deal with Russia. And when this goes on, and he kind of like, you know, goes against the United States, we put an embargo on Cuba. That's why we can't buy Cuban cigars. 
I've never had one in the United States. I, I promise. No. Anyway, so um, still to this day there are sanctions. We've, we've lifted them a little bit because he's really sick now and his, butt, his brother Raul's taking over. You know, but it's the longest running um, uh, regime technically of communism so far. Anyway, um, now, we didn't like the fact that the communists were right in our backyard. 90 miles from Florida. That's for like from here to Michigan State, by the way. It's not very far. You can drive there, man. In, you know, <clears throat> if you drive fast, right, you can get there in, I don't know, an hour. So, this is not good. And we can't have this. So, Eisenhower was still president at this time. Um, the switchover, although the elections in 1960, the actual transition will be in the beginning of 61. So, Eisenhower and the CIA come up with this idea. And I would say it's probably not the most well laid out idea ever. And the plan is to overthrow Castro. Now, how are they going to do that? Well, all these Cuban exiles were in South Florida, like in Miami. They wanted to go back to their country. They wanted their country back, and they wanted to have a democracy. They just didn't want Castro there. So they secretly, I don't know how you could do it secretly, but they secretly trained about, I don't know, it was about 1,500 or 3,000 of these exiles to fight. Because technically, we can go over there and invade ourselves. Because that would have been provoking war, you know? So they, they uh, train these guys, and what they're going to do is they're going to drop them off at a place in Cuba called the Bay of Pigs. That's, that's the name of it. So it's a bay. It's called the Bay of Pigs. And we're going to drop these guys off, and they're going to then fight their way to the capital, take it over, and then we'll install a new government. Well, do you think you can keep something like that secret? So we drop them off, they get on the shore, and they get annihilated. They were waiting for them, okay, because they knew the plan. It was a debacle. So um, anyway, it's a failure. It's an utter failure. And this is JFK's first like thing, you know. It makes him look really bad. So it also makes him look weak because it was failed. Now, it wasn't his idea. He, but he happened to be the president at the time that it was executed. <clears throat> anyway, so that's called the, the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion. All right? Um, another crisis that was happening in the early 1960s was, um, sorry. in the early 1960s, I mean, ever since Berlin had become, well, Berlin had become divided and half of it was communist and half of it was free, people from the east side, the communist side, were coming over to the free side. They didn't want to stay over there. I mean, for good reason. So the German, I'm sorry, the Soviets or the communists did not like that. What does that signify? I mean, if, if it's so awesome over in the communist states, why are people leaving? Right? And so in order to, um, you know, cut that off, <clears throat> they started making the border between East and West Berlin a little bit more solid. In fact, um, as this is going on, uh, Kennedy goes over to Berlin. And he gives one of the most famous speeches, and he actually speaks some Germany. He's like, Ich Bach Berliner, I can't remember what he says. But he's talking to the Berliners and the fact that they should be free. But in around the same time period, <clears throat> the Berlin Wall goes up. Now, earlier we talked about the Iron Curtain being a dividing point between the East and the West, right? This is a physical wall and barrier between what we would consider free and democratic and what we would consider communist and not free, okay? Um, the wall goes up in a matter of like weeks. In fact, I have this, um, uh, remind me to find, I, I've got this diagram, it's really cool. So remind me tomorrow, I'll find it for you. So the Berlin Wall goes up in 61, does not come down until when, does anybody know? 
1989 technically, because uh, that's when the Polish actually start revolting against the, uh, the, the USSR. So it stops the flow, and after this point, I mean, there are people that get through, <clears throat> but a lot of people die trying, and I mean, there's all kinds of crazy ideas, you know, people taking balloons and stuff and trying to go over, digging tunnels underneath. There were tunnels. Now, <clears throat> for the main, the main course today, this is the big one. All these little things kind of lead up to this, okay, in a way. This was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, there's a really good movie called 13 Days. Normally, I watch part of that, but because we got behind with all the snow days and stuff, I'm not going to. But it's worth watching. Well, tomorrow, we're going to watch some United Streaming so you can get some visuals out of this. <clears throat> so I'm not going to watch it tomorrow. So we're talking about October 1962. Uh, Kennedy's still president. Okay. U-2 spy plane is flying over Cuba and sees what David saw at the American History Museum. Okay? They bring him in, they start looking at him, they start seeing these little cylindrical like shapes. They look like cigars. But then when they really look at them, they realize that they are um, missile shells. Okay? But they're not totally together. So it's part of the missile, not all of it. What do we realize when we see this? That the Russians have been bringing over these missiles, and they're going to eventually have fully capable missiles. Not good. Because the missiles that they brought over were called medium-range missiles. See, there's missiles that can go from the United States to Russia. Those are called intercontinental. These, are, these other ones, there's all kinds of them. These could reach Washington, D.C., possibly New York, maybe Detroit, in five minutes. Five minutes. You have five minutes to react. So you either press the button or you die. The button meaning us sending ours over too. Okay. So we, we you know we, we see this data in the pictures and um, we call the Russians out on it and they're like I don't know what's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do you mean missiles in Cuba? That's ridiculous. <clears throat> and in order to prove it, we send like a couple. F-16s or whatever they're called, and they, they're low flying and they go over, you know, these missile sites really low and take close-ups of these pictures. They did, they tried, but, you know, they shot the planes but they didn't shoot them down the rocks. That's why you got to watch the movie, 13 Days, it's really good, because that's the part I would show you. Maybe tomorrow. So anyway, um, they, they get the proof. And then JFK goes on TV, it's a very famous speech. He goes on TV, he says, the Russians have uh, aggressive weapons. Uh, in Cuba, we will do whatever we have to do to protect our citizenship, including a nuclear strike. Scares the living daylights out of everybody, not only in the United States, but in the world. This is, a, this is the closest we ever came to a nuclear war. And I hope we never do again. So, um, so anyway, they continue to deny, to deny all these things. And the... Um, uh, let's see here one second. So then, we're trying to reach them diplomatically through the United Nations. It's not really going too well, okay? And you never know, because if there's intermediaries, it, you know, things could get lost in translation, per se. So they're trying to open up communications between the Russians so we can stave off a disaster, as they say. And um, so, in the meantime, we can't attack Cuba because that would be aggressive, although the military wanted to do that. So they come up with this other idea. It's kind of like the Berlin Airlift, right? It's like thinking outside the box. They said, oh, let's quarantine the area around Cuba. You guys know what quarantine is? It's like, you know, somebody's sick and you got to put them in another room, okay? So no ships can go in and out. And they're going to, this gives them the opportunity to inspect those ships when they come in, too. And so, um, of course, we weren't looking for sickness. We were looking for weapons. All these Russian ships are coming over to drop off the rest of the materials for the missiles. And all of them turn back except for maybe two. And they go through the lines. Okay? And 
this is when it became very tense because they had to, they started like, you know, there was, we had nuclear subs, we had subs in the area. Um, you know, if we had to, we would have sunk the ship. But to make a long story short, it eventually turned around because they started talking behind the lines. So JFK ends up, they end up making a deal. So Khrushchev and him make a deal. And the deal is, um, you, see, if you think about it, what's fair is fair. We had offensive weapons in Turkey. Turkey is in NATO, they're one of our allies. We had weapons pointing at Russia right here. So the Russians are like, well, why can't we have them over there? Makes, it's, it's only even that way, right? So JFK makes a deal. We decide, he decides we're going to remove our weapons from uh, Turkey, and we agree not to attack Cuba. They remove their weapons from Cuba. Now, I think that's a compromise, right? You know, we avoided nuclear war. However, both leaders are, are seen as weak after this. Especially, you can't be seen as weak in, in the Soviet Union. So, very soon after, Khrushchev is out of power. Um, Kennedy lost Cuba. Fidel's still in power. So, people do not have confidence in JFK. At the same time, um, Castro says to all these people that don't like him, Okay, I'm going to give you one opportunity to get out of Cuba. It was called the... Um, there's a name for it. Swim Act. Um, there's a name for this. 300,000 Cubans on all kinds of boats. Their cousins, whoever from Florida came down there. I mean, they're coming across, you know, the Caribbean Sea or whatever, to Florida. And they ended up becoming exiles of Cuba and then living in South Florida. That's why when you go to Miami or South Florida, it's seriously, it's like Little Havana. That's what they call it. This is all Cuban stuff. And that's one of the reasons, okay? And then he closed his, he closed shop. Nobody in or out after that, you know? Okay, questions? You had a question, David, or something? What about the blockade of oh, right. Cuba? Oh, well, the blockade was lifted after the ships were turned around. Yeah, but uh, you, never, you never really talked about it, what had happened. So, I mean. Well, the blockade was a quarantine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Blockade was a, it was a blockade technically, but we call it a quarantine. Well, we had U.S. ships down there, and the Cubans had Cuban, or the Russians had ships down there too. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, the last thing, last two things I want to talk about. This was a scary time, seriously, in, in the world, in the United States, and because of this, and if you ever watch any shows or anything, the president will have a red phone on his desk. Yeah. The red phone is for one reason. It's a direct line. To the Soviet Union because they have 10,000 nukes and so do we. Yeah. And if there's ever a problem, we want to be able to talk before we shoot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so they installed what's called the hotline in 1963. That, yeah. Oh, it's and it's a direct communication. Have you ever seen the movie Some of All Fears? Yeah. Oh my gosh, the best movie ever. Um, what, what do you mean? Like this way? Yeah. Okay. All right. So they installed the, the hotline, still there. If you watch some of all fears, they actually do it through the internet. Uh, really good movie. And then, and what is the some of all fears? The some of all fears is when the Soviet Union collapsed, that terrorists and people that, you know, the fact that they don't secure their weapons like we do, what if a terrorist or somebody gets their hands on just one of those nukes? You know? It's not good. Also during this time period, in your packet, and I will um, say this correctly for... Uh, and here, or you guys, they, there's several trees that are going to happen during this time period of the Cold War. Salt, there's going to be like salt one, salt two, and then there's going to be start, which is going to happen later. One of the first trees that was signed was called the Limited Test Ban Treaty. What that said was we could no longer test weapons in the atmosphere, which means above ground. So guess what they did? Underground. It did it underground. Is that safe? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. We'll start a, like a, an earthquake, right? So, um, but now we, because we're sophisticated, we don't have to do that. We just do the tests on the computers, and we can know how strong one of our weapons is. You know.